Good morning and welcome to St. Michael's Episcopal Church in O'Fallon. Welcome to you who are worshiping with us online this morning and happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers. Well, I guess to everybody, whether you're a mother or not. And uh, we, we welcome you to our worship this morning. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we might perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose Son Jesus is the Good Shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which is in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lido was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not me lie down in green. for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the Revelation to John. I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. It was the festival of the dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. Sam's wife was having hearing problems. So the next time Sam was in the doctor's office, he asked if he should make an appointment for her to come in and be tested. Having a hunch this might be premature, the doctor told Sam that he, should, he, he could do some initial screening at home himself. Here's what you do, the doctor said. Stand about 40 feet away from her and speak in a normal conversational tone and see if she hears you. If she doesn't, then move to 30 feet, and then 20 feet, and so on, until she responds. Well, that evening, Sam's wife was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and he's in the living room remembering the doctor's suggestion. So he says to himself, I'm about 40 feet away. Let's see what happens. Honey, what's for supper? Sam gets no response. He moves close to the end of the living room, about 30 feet away, and says again, Honey, what's for supper? Again, his wife gives no response. Sam then moves into the dining room, about 20 feet away from his wife. Honey, he says for the third time, what's for supper? Still, he gets no response. Standing right in the kitchen door, about 10 feet away, Sam says, Honey, what's for supper? Again, no response. Sam can't believe it, and he's starting to get upset. This is terrible, he thinks to himself. So finally, Sam walks right up behind his wife, who is attending a pan on the stove. Honey, what's for supper? She turns around and looks him in the eye and says, For the fifth time, I said chicken. Are we like Sam when we pray? When it comes to our relationship with God and our prayer life and how we make decisions and how we react to tragedies and emergencies and even how we react to the joys in our life, sometimes the way our conversation with God works gets a little weird. We get confused because so much of life seems to be about getting our needs met to our satisfaction. At least, we often think so much of life is about that. We assume that the same rules we follow to get what we want must also apply to all of our conversations with God. This morning, I'd like to ask you to think about a couple of things. Number one, have you noticed that we are always blaming God for not listening to us when maybe the problem is that we are not listening to God? Number two, on top of that, have you ever noticed that we seem to have selective hearing? Family members are usually pretty attuned to our selective hearing, and we to theirs, because we all have it. 
but it's a problem or a habit that really sticks out at home. When it comes to our faith, we should notice that we suffer from selective reading, too, and selective interpretation, and selective doctrine formation. Were this not true, we probably would have at least 200 fewer denominations of Christianity on the planet today. Have you ever noticed that maybe sometimes, this is three by the way, have you ever noticed that maybe sometimes you pretend to hear the person that's talking to you, but nothing is sinking in because in reality you're listening to something else at the same time? Maybe out of the corner of your eye you're still trying to follow a movie on TV, or you're trying to listen to the ball game, and you just can't switch your listening from one thing to the other that easily. But you turn your head and pretend that you're listening, and bylines on the bottom of the television screen going by tell you what's happening. You might even nod a few times. This could very well be the kind of issue that Jesus finds himself facing in our gospel reading this morning. A bunch of the people that have been following Jesus around, plus some of the Jews, the official Jewish big shots, they ask him point blank in the temple one day, Quit beating around the bush, they say. We are dying to know. Just come right out and tell us if you are the Messiah or not. Surprisingly, Jesus says, I've told you. I've been telling you. What more do I need to say? I have told you and still you don't believe. It's pretty amazing and it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. These people had been seeing Jesus do the work of Messiah right in front of them every day, and yet somehow the miracles that they were seeing done with their own eyes were not straightforward enough for them. Perhaps they had eyes but could not see, and ears but could not hear. Or maybe they just couldn't believe what they were seeing or hearing. Do you ever see or hear only what you might already expect? to see or hear? I know I do. Sometimes that's why I can't find something I'm looking for. I expect to see whatever I'm already thinking of instead of whatever I find. We are surrounded with voices. Too many voices. Every day these voices are telling us something that we need to think, something that we need to do or to buy something we need to react to in order to prove that we care. There's no end to it. Everywhere we look, there are people, businesses and corporations, politicians and newscasters, all trying to manipulate us into paying the most attention to them all day long and to believe them. Don't listen to those other guys, they say. They, meaning everybody else, are biased and off base and out of touch with reality. Never trust them or their perspective. You can trust what we tell you, though. Ever heard anything like that from anybody in your life? <laughs> There's no such thing as a neutral or objective voice anymore. We just hear pushy, bossy noise from every direction, every station, every party, every special interest group, every school or thought, uh, everyone who claims that they are the ones who really care. And it's all noise. It's all noise that tends to get us riled up and distracted from the voice of our God. Where does the voice of Jesus come in? Remember Jesus? Many of you probably know from experience that babies know their mother's voice fresh out of the womb, and often their father's voice too. They listen to those voices in mom's belly as they are developing their sense of hearing. After they're born, from a very early age, they can pick that familiar voice out of a crowd of people who are all talking at the same time. And they will seek it out, trying to see where it's coming from. When our son Dan was still in the womb, I used to put my face against my wife's belly and talk to him. I would tell him stories and jokes, and sometimes sing a little bit. On the day he was born, just a couple of minutes after the nurses had first gotten him to cry and they were cleaning him up, I went over to the table where he was being washed across the delivery room, and I said something like, 
Hi, Dan, it's good to finally see you. Instantly, he got quiet and turned his head and stared at me. He knew my voice. I didn't think a newborn could turn his head, but he was looking for the source of that voice. One reassuring thing for those of us who may be confused about God and salvation is that thing that Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. Notice right after he says that, Jesus also says, And I know them. He doesn't say, they know me, necessarily. He says, they know my voice. Now, maybe I'm being a little picky here, and I hope you don't hold me to it when we get to heaven. But ask yourself if this might be possible. Could it be that some people might be convinced that they are following the right thing, and it's not Jesus, but that the voice that they're still hearing is really Jesus' voice? Perhaps some people are following Jesus when they don't even know that they're following Jesus. Maybe they were brought up to think that Jesus is a myth, or that the church is not to be trusted, or that Christianity is wrong and stupid. Or maybe they just never heard the gospel. But they don't realize that all the good and right stuff that they believe does not come from where they think it comes from. Rather, it comes straight from Jesus' mouth. The world we live in is full of deception when it comes to the spiritual and moral aspects of our lives. We're being told that ideas we always thought were bad are now somehow good, and that things we know are good have somehow become bad. The Apostle Paul told us this would happen someday. Of course, we humans have always loved to have our ears tickled, so to speak. But it's only very recently in our free society that groups have gone so far as to try to claim that opinions they disagree with should be silenced. And that people who speak those opinions out loud are ignorant or evil and should be punished and ridiculed for doing so. In a country where we enjoy the right of free speech, there should be no such thing as a quote-unquote cancel culture. Where would such a voice come from? What voice are these angry people listening to? And who is it that knows them? There really is a great deceiver. Anyone, should any one voice be trying to control other voices? When that happens, we should all sense that something is amiss, no matter who we agree with or disagree with. So what voice are we listening to? What voice are you listening to? Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy mind, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's a voice. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. Hmm. There are those, and their number is growing, who would stand up right now and say, you can't say that. That's not inclusive. That's prejudicial. That's oppressive. Even that's hate language. Seriously? It's a twisted voice that's getting louder every day. It's a controlling voice. And love does not need to control. If your pulse has quickened, calm down <laughs> and breathe slowly. This is why radios and TVs have off buttons. What do you listen to? How about turning off all those things that fill your ears and minds with garbage and anger and fluff and spam? Turn off all those things that waste your time and your brain and your heart. And then get yourself to a quiet place, both physically and inside yourself, and listen. 
who do you hear? Is there a still small voice? I hope it's Jesus. The closer you follow him, the easier it is to hear what he has to say to you. And he always has something to say to you. The Lord is our shepherd. If we go where he shows us we should go, we will want for nothing. If we stay close where we can hear his voice, we will be secure. Now, does that mean that we will like everything he says? I don't think so. It does not mean that life will be problem-free. On the contrary. But he offers green pastures for us to lie down in, and he will lead us beside still waters. He revives our souls, and he guides us along paths of righteousness for his name's sake, for our sake, too. There are times when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and it's dark, and we cannot see the way. But we need to fear no evil, because God is with us. We might not be able to see him, but his voice is there. His walking stick and his crutches, they are a comfort to us. Our God is so generous, he even spreads a table before us, covered with good food and wine. And he spreads this table for us right out there in front of our enemies, who think we don't deserve it, who think that we should be canceled. Then our Lord anoints us with oil. Imagine that. Our cup is running over. Surely his goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Listen. That's his voice. He's telling us it's supper time. And now let us stand and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are form six in the Book of Common Prayer, beginning on page 392. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For 
for our president and for all who serve for this community, the nation, and the world. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. We pray especially for the people and leaders of Ukraine and Russia, refugees and the countries that are receiving them, and those who have lost their homes and loved ones. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Brian, our bishop-elect, for Paul, our assisting bishop and the standing committee, for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, for especially Alex, Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Adam, Andrea, Barbara, Jared, Joe, Bailey, Ellis, Ray, Jalen, Cervella, Father Greg, and Linda. Are there others? For those who are celebrating birthdays this week, especially Cervella, Dennis, Nels, and Michael. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever. We pray for all who have died, especially Steve Etzel, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful, most merciful Father. Father. In your in compassion, your forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in everlasting life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. may be seated. Once again, I want to say uh, happy Mother's Day and uh, welcome to all of you. It's good to see you. Um, we have some roses here for the mothers and uh, the ushers, when we do our offertory, the ushers will take those to the back and 
they'll be distributing them to you as you leave. If you are a mother, or if you had a mother, or if you know a mother, <laughs> please uh, take one, and if you uh, don't want to keep it for yourself, you can share it with uh, someone else. But uh, we, we want to make sure that our mothers are honored. Um, if Jesus didn't have a mother, we would all be in a very difficult situation. Let's walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself a perfect offering and sacrifice to love to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. 
Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious Father, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things into subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with St. Michael and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Jesus. 
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Behold the Lamb of God who bears our sins, shed for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So we share in this bread. a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the King. The body of our Savior Jesus Christ torn for you and remember the wounds that heal the death that brings us life paid the price to make us one so we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a our bonds of love around the table of the King. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember he drained death's cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his 
his body here on earth as we share in his suffering and proclaim Christ will come again and we'll join in this feast of heaven around the table of the King Please stand. Let us share in the post uh, Eucharistic prayer for Easter that's in your bulletin. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the waters of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage into sin, into true and lasting life uh, freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And the blessing of God, the Father Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please be seated. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on coming up in this uh, parish and in our diocese and uh, I'm having my surgery this Tuesday uh, day after tomorrow so if you would pray for me that day I would appreciate it I, I assume everything will go well but uh, prayers never hurt <laughs> um, on the 20th we have the consecration of our new bishop up in Springfield, and I'm sure that some of you are at least planning on going. Um, I, I, of course, uh, will be there. Um, I don't know if there's much more to say about that, but please keep uh, both our diocese and our new bishop in your prayers. Um, there's nothing that the devil likes more than to get in between the cracks between people and, and uh, create dissension in the church and, and make us a divided body. So if you would pray for uh, strength and unity, and uh, unity doesn't mean we all believe the same thing. Unity just means that we are united in Christ. Because we break one bread, we are one body. And so we need to keep our eyes on Christ and not on differences in the, in the bread. <laughs> um, on the 26th, which is a Thursday, I believe, we are going to be having an Ascension Day service here at the church, and it's, uh, it's for the whole deanery that is our section of the diocese, and I've sent out invitations to uh, the clergy within a, about a 50-mile radius and uh, ask them to invite everyone that they want to invite. We invite all of you to, to come to that. Um, those of us who are clergy in the deanery will be sharing responsibilities for that. I will be preaching, and it should be a, a, an enjoyable time of getting to know one another, uh, especially people from other congregations that we seldom get to meet. Uh, let's see. And then June 8th is when we're talking about the Strawberry Festival. Is that correct? Somebody tell me that's correct. <laughs> Oh, 18th? Okay. I knew there was an 8 in there. 
It's, uh, oh yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's, it's the 18th because then the next day Bill has to leave. Uh, the 18th of June, uh, we're going to have a strawberry festival, which is going to be not only a, uh, a fundraiser, but hopefully a lot of fun. It'll be sort of a picnic type of affair, and we'll have stuff for the kids to do, and stuff for adults to do, and uh, lots of yummy things to eat. We'll be grilling stuff on the grill, and not the, not the strawberries, of course, but we'll be <laughs> grilling hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill and uh, it should be a, a very good time. Any other announcements? Okay, let's continue our worship with our final hymn. Alleluia. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.